healing wound care gurus out there. Welcome to this evening's Facebook Live interview. We're excited about our guest and our topic. Um, got a lot of stuff exciting happen out there, but just a, some quick little uh, logistical stuff to handle. Again, just letting you guys know that we do have some debridement courses coming up. One coming up um, you know, this later on this week on Saturday. We still have a couple of uh, spots available. So if you want to register last minute, we can still take a couple of last minute registrations yet. Still have some seats open. There's plenty of room in our upcoming classes in Minneapolis, Philly, Salt Lake, Kansas City, Milwaukee. So uh, please um, pass this on, share it with your colleagues that are looking to get some debridement training. It's an excellent course if we do say so ourselves. Um, but it really, I, I trust me, you guys will get a lot out of it. Um, anyways, I'm excited about tonight. Uh, this is a topic that, you know, personally, I've invested a lot of time in researching myself. Um, I will be honest with you. I came from a um, position before early on in my career that, you know, followed what most people do, you know, which is the, you know, the ABI guidelines were the kind of the rule of law. And stuff like that. And I didn't bother to question it. I didn't think about it. I didn't look into any research and say, well, that, mu that must be right. It makes sense. But things changed when I was challenged. So, and I was challenged by our guest tonight. So let me bring on our guest this evening. Uh, welcome to the show, Dr. Miller. Thank you for coming back. I do believe this is the third time. So this is the hat trick. <laughs> this is it. Third time's a charm. You bet. Yeah. Well, welcome to the show tonight. I really appreciate Thank you. Uh, you giving us and sharing your time with us. I think, again, our audience always has appreciated and well liked all of the previous interviews we've done. I know this is a topic for you that really, you know, something that is near and dear to your heart because you've done a lot of research. Um, you even told me earlier before the show how you had spent a lot of time prepping for tonight because you really wanted to make True. sure to give the audience some excellent, excellent um, material. So, but I want to share a quick story with our audience and how you and I met, you know, because obviously we have not been friends forever. Um, I've been in the wound care world myself for over 25 years. And I met you at a Wild on Wounds conference, I'm not sure, six, seven years ago, probably. And I remember it because you were doing a talk and a lecture on Venus uh, the venous system and compression. And then we had organized a hands-on lab after it for the attendees to go where we had them practice with different wrapping devices. And I was one of the room monitors and kind of observing the students and correcting them if they needed it, stuff like that. And I remember in your lecture, you talked about how you don't need an ABI as far as confirming how much compression is needed because compression isn't going to cut off the blood flow. And I have to be honest with you, I sat in that chair and it was like a gut punch because that went against everything I had been taught in previous seminars that I had gone to and what I'd read, what I'd been taught. And I was just like, you know, I just sat there and it sat in my craw in just the wrong way. But it also got me thinking. I'm like, wait a second. He does have a point, but it's it's really just kind of not adding up to me. So I remember coming up to you after the lab was over. All right. We'd never really met before and um, other just in passing at maybe a previous conference, but we really didn't have a, much of a collegial re relationship or anything at that point. And I'm like, Doc, I got a question for you because I'm really struggling with this whole you know, the ABI thing and it can't compress. And, and you're like, here, Bill, and I'm just going to, for a bridge purposes, shorten the story up. But basically what you said here, let me demonstrate. And you said, give me your arm. And you grabbed my arm around the bicep area and you squeezed to a point to, to basically occlude my brachial artery. And when you got to that point, I was in quite significant discomfort at that point. And you're like, does that hurt? I'm like, yeah. He goes, do you think a compression bandage can create that kind of pressure or pain when you wrap a leg? I'm like, no, that would make no sense that it would ever done it. Because I had wrapped my own leg, had my other leg wrapped before just in you know practice things. I'm like, never completed that. So 
that was a eye-opening experience for me. It's like, wait a second, how do these wraps collapse those deep arteries when right. you showed me how much it took with your hand to cr- to collapse mine? And and that really led me into really starting to challenge the evidence that was being taught as evidence. And right. I know that we were kind of talking earlier, so you know about what. What are, what are some of your own personal thoughts on what is often considered evidence-based practice today? It's, it's an interesting concept. We, we, we get out there and we talk about being evidence-based practitioners. And the problem is that it's just, it, it's words that we use. Um, you know, the problem is, is that people don't, they pick and choose what evidence they like and say, I'm evidence-based here and here. But nobody ever says, well, I'm not evidence-based over here. And, you know, the problem is in wound care, the evidence overall really sucks. It's it's not good. There's very, very few good double-blind randomized studies. Um, so you pick and choose. I mean, you know, what what's left if there's no double-blind randomized studies, which again, very poor, very hard to do. Well, then the next thing is uh, expert consensus from those. But the expert consensus needs to be based on hard facts, things like anatomy and physiology and as we said earlier, the laws of physics, you know, Boyle's law, Poiseuille's law, law of Laplace, the laws of physics are irrefutable. They've never been changed. Right. So recognizing that there are people grinding their teeth now saying, much like I did, oh, God, if I only can get out of high school physics, I swear to never, ever, ever <laughs> do this again. For better or worse, my wound care practice is based on all the laws of physics. It's a horrible admission. I do so publicly with no pride. But <laughs> You know, and again, back to the evidence, you say, well, I'm an evidence based practitioner, but I use Dakin solution, uh, which has no evidence, none, zero, zip, right. none. And the evidence there is in, in the article I wrote called the death of Dr. Dakin's magical panacea cuts it to shreds in five different ways. Um, swab culturing, which there are still people, you know, I tell people you want to swab a wound, go ahead, but then you have to get a fresh one and swab your nose. And whatever we grow, you have to let me treat. And I've never had a nurse in 30 years agree to accept that premise. Right. Um, using using negative pressure at 125 continuous. 99% of the negative pressure in the world is 125 continuous. And it makes absolutely no sense. And there's no literature that shows that's the best. In fact, there's literature showing that's not the best. And, and I did a, a paper years ago in Wounds talking about why it's not good. Um, Una boots here in Indianapolis, a uh, tuba grip, you know, five mil. we'll talk five millimeters, 10 millimeters of compression. That's the compression used at almost every wound care center in Indianapolis. Um, Una's boots, the, the Cochrane report absolutely comes out and condemns them. And yet they're still doing that. And last but not least, diabetic neuropathic plantar based ulcers. Everyone agrees TCC is the gold standard. And yet there's less than 20% of people doing TCC. Right. Mm-hmm. So I have a real conundrum and I I tell people, look, it doesn't matter to me what you're telling the public as long as you admit that you're not doing evidence based. If you're willing to say to the public, what we do is not evidence based. I got no problem. Then then go ahead and do your wound care. But to deceive people by saying, oh, no, we're evidence based and then doing this is just, you know, the problem is people don't look at the real science. They look at what they were taught much as you had admitted. And I was the same way. Mm-hmm. I came out of a general surgical residency and what I learned that was gospel because my trainers had done it. And it was only when I started to scratch my head and say, wait a minute, this doesn't make sense. Right. This is not, how can I have the anatomy and physiology saying this and you guys telling me this, it just doesn't work. And right. you know, the many programs you and I have done together and at Wild on Wounds and other conferences kind of right. decry all that stuff. You know, another one I'm laughing at now is this, they're, they're touting a pressure reducing dressing and I keep scratching my head saying, wait a minute, if I punch someone in the face and put that dressing over their face and then punch them again, I'm not going to do any less damage. How, how does a dressing reduce pressure? Pressure goes through, and yet that's the advertising, pressure reducing dressings. I mean, right. the laws of physics have never been refuted. Anatomy and physiology is the way it is. And, you know, so that's kind of the lead into our topic is sure. the evidence is there. You just got to look at it. Right. Well, before we get into the topic, because obviously we're going to have some new listeners tonight. Um, and so why don't you just give us a little bit about your background so the audience kind of knows a little bit about Doc Miller before we dive into our topic for this evening. All right. Well, I, I mean, I'm, I'm a board certified general surgeon and about third, uh, gosh, almost 30 years ago, 
Um, though I've been doing wound care as a general surgeon and at that point thought I knew what I was doing um, and really didn't. I was doing what everyone else was doing and then realized that there was more. And so the, the jokingly, the two initial products I used were, were three products, were calcium alginate and we wet it and put it on and that's how it worked, not realizing that that's the complete wrong thing. We used a product called Scarlet Red, which is an aniline dye that increases epithelialization. And of course, the last product we use, and forgive me for using the name, was Duoderm. And in those days, Duoderm was about four inches thick. And uh, for those who was old enough, and that's what you had. And that's what you did. And then doing trial and error and going to conferences and saying, hey, here's what I'm doing. What do you think? And so uh, 97, 98 went full time into wound care. Since then have expanded. I now run a large multi-specialty group in Indianapolis that does all sorts of crazy medical things. Mm. But um, teaching is what I do. And in terms of teaching as you and the listeners will see and many have seen um, I like to create angst. I like to create controversy. I like to make people uncomfortable in what they're doing sure. in the hopes that they will look at what they're doing and decide, yes, this is good. I don't care what Miller says, or you know what? That guy may actually be right for the first time in his <laughs> life. Awesome. That's funny. Well, listen, I want to start out by kind of establishing some baseline facts when it comes to venous disease and compression. And and I've heard you speak this, you know, and, and I've been teaching it in my practice for years now. And that is in order to, and I just want your affirmation, basically, in order to effectively treat venous disease in any patient whose legs will be in a dependent position, you're going to have to apply at least 30 upwards of 50 millimeters of mercury of compression for it to be effective. Is that a kind of an established baseline fact? Yeah, the, the, we've got plenty of good studies and plenty of research that show that standing static pressure, when you stand and don't move, average pressure in your lower extremity venous system is 90 millimeters of mercury. So when I'm right. teaching my fourth year medical students, we talk 90. Now, somebody young and healthy like you with great GAMS, um, you're going to engage gastrocnemius soleus. You have lovely fascia around your leg, beautiful valves. So you're probably pushing a pressure blowing that blood out of there down to a pressure of 30 millimeters of mercury. When you look at someone old and feeble like myself with a total hip on both sides and a total knee on one, I've got so much scarring that the best pressure I can probably get and the overwhelming majority of our patients are, as you said, even pumping and whatever without elevating the leg, let's mm -hmm. make that, dependency, best they can get is 50 to 60 millimeters of mercury and that's best. Wow. So that's that's kind of your keying pressure for those that you're going to see. You're not going to see the 30s. I mm -hmm. love my nurses and therapists to wear compression stocks at 30. That takes away the limited edema they might have after a hard day. But right. for the old and the feeble, you need 50 millimeters of mercury compression. And that's what almost every product in the venous spectrum that they talk about, from the Velcro-based products to the four-layer, two-layer, whatever, they get, they're keyed at 50. That's what you're looking for. All right. All right. So, my, so then my next baseline fact is that then any compression that's under 30 is only going to be effective when somebody is supine with their feet at or above the heart. Is that a correct? Absolutely. Word? Yep. You elevate your legs, you're going to drop the pressures up. That's, but, and, and, and that's, that's an easy fix. The problem is that also kills quality of life. Telling your patients, well, you know, when you can sit in the lazy boy with your legs elevated and pump your feet is great. But telling someone you need to spend eight hours a day in the chair. Yeah, you're, you're, you're a non quality of life practitioner. <laughs> nobody but nobody can do that. Right. The good news is that creates cox ischial and uh, coxygeal pressure sores, though. Right, exactly. And then the last one is that I want to just establish for our audience and our viewing audience and listening audiences. The purpose of an ABI is to diagnose arterial disease and its severity. That's correct. why you do in, one, correct? In macrovascular disease, and I want to underline double bold font that, macrovascular disease. Yeah, the ABI, and again, I'm trained, I did a year of vascular training. The ABI is great if you're concerned about their circulation, if they have distal ischemia, distal ulcers of the toes. But a mid-leg ulcer, a mid-leg problem with warm, healthy feet, 
Uh, probably not an arterial problem lurking in the background. Right. All right. Excellent. Excellent. Good deal. Well, with that, then let's kind of move on into our topic. And let's, I want to start with this because everybody is obviously familiar with these things that are often referred to as the ABI guidelines. And by the way, before I go any further, audience out there, I know we got a lot of you watching tonight. If you have any questions for Dr. Miller, please type them into the comment section. They come up on my screen here. Um, I have a gal from Denmark that was watching earlier, but she had to check out because she's got to get up at 7 a.m. And I'm thinking it's pretty late in Denmark compared to here. Yeah. But, uh, she was asking if this is recorded. Yes, it is recorded. It's available on our Facebook page and on our YouTube channel. So you can watch it anytime. So again, you can share this with your colleagues after tonight. So again, if anybody has questions as we go through tonight, please feel free to type them in. I know Doc Miller will be happily or happy to answer any of those questions. So getting back to those ABI guidelines that we have had, you know, proliferated throughout wound care for years and years. And years. I mean, from the very beginning, when I started yeah. wound care 25 plus years ago, you know, when we got to compression, boom, everybody talked about the ABI guidelines. Okay. What is the actual science and evidence of, of behind those guidelines that is promoted throughout the wound care industry? Well, the issue was trying to be concerned about whether or not there was adequate, and again, I'll use a general word, circulation to the lower leg. And normally when you use the word circulation, you're talking arterial. We don't use the word circulation referable to the venous or lymphatic system for that matter, though arguably lymphatics aren't circular. But sure. what they did is they looked at this and, and correlated it with uh, ischemic disease, intermittent claudication, things like that, and they created created a range and basically what an ABI is it uses a Doppler and point of information Dopplers create a signal they're electromechanical devices you palpate a pulse when you use a stethoscope you are hearing Karotkov sounds but an electromechanical device Dopplers create signals so you put the cuff on above you put the uh, the Doppler on the brachial artery or your radial is fine you blow the cuff up until the signal disappears when the signal returns that you write down that number it's it's systolic you do the same thing in the foot either dorsalis pedis or, or, or tibial posterior tibial same thing put it on the calf low pump it up signal disappears blow it down as soon as the signal reappears and it's the ankle number over the brachial number gives you a ratio um normally legs should have better circulation or you know bigger vessels so one is what you're looking for equal circulation leg and arm if you get a 0.8 where arguably the arm or leg circulation is 80% of the leg, they consider that um, compromised arterial circulation. And then there's gradations. You know, a 0.2 ABI is critical limb ischemia. Um, and again, years and years, basically, that was what was called the gold standard. And from there, it transcends. They said, well, if you've got artery circulation, what could make it worse? Well, the next thought without any science was wrapping something around it. Right. So that's kind of where it came from then. That's it. That's and it. So there really isn't what you're saying, any science behind those guidelines based on actually any clinical studies and or anatomical and physiological evidence. In terms of identifying arterial disease, absolutely, that, that 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 they're great. That's what you use to identify arterial disease. But it completely disconnects when you start talking about, well, can I or can I not compression? And and you know that that's what we're talking about tonight. What does the ABI have to do with your ability to compress? And as we continue, hopefully our audience will see absolutely nothing. They are right. completely unrelated for a thousand reasons, and we're just gonna give you the, the, the main ones, and you'll yeah. see that it's not necessary. Looking for disease, absolute nice to know, but it has nothing to do with compression. Right, no, okay, because like I said, I mean, for many, many years, there was always, they tried to make that correlation that you have, your ABI tells you how strong your can compression can be. And, no. Um, no and like I said, but you know, like you and I, I remember talking to you about it, and I went out there myself and tried to find studies that backed up these ABI guidelines. I couldn't find anything where they did a clinical study years. that showed this correlation that they were trying to infer by these no. guidelines. 
So let now, me ask you this, and why do you think these guidelines were established in the first place and then promoted? If there's no evidence behind them, what's the point of pushing something like that out there? Paranoia. I mean, it's the same reason why several of our wound dressings print on the dressing this side down, even though you look at it and it's obvious. Basically, what I believe, and I have no proof to back this up, is that when they started to look at this, they didn't ask clinicians. They had their legal department say, well, what are the potential complications? And some legal eagle said, hey, you know, aren't you guys worried about somebody wrapping it too tight and cutting off the circulation? I mean, you know, people wrap stuff around their neck and choke. Well, you, won't that happen? And so basically they said, well, let's see what the artery studies are. And they said, okay, 0.8 or below is arterial disease. And then they created an artificial connection and said, all right, we have this unfounded scientific paranoia over here. And on this side, we've got this science that's unrelated. But you know what? We need to cover because the first time someone does that, you know, it's like, right. why did they put their poodle in the microwave to dry it? Well, because they thought <laughs> it was the same concept. We better, better write this down. But as you said, there's no studies. There's no studies showing that correlation. And there's never been a correlation, but we've all been trained that. And the problem is there are lots, millions of patients that can be helped that are not because people adhere to this unscientific, non-evidence-based paranoia. All right. Now, there's a couple of questions. One that came up, but we're going to handle it when we kind of get to the, uh, the uh, um, arterial disease and calcifications. But the gal asked, our gal from Denmark, about you know diabetes and the false high ABIs, but I think we're going to cover that. Lovely when we get question. To that point. Lovely question. Uh, Let's remind I did, me. I did get another question from a, a gentleman I, I've interacted with many times on Facebook, and um, it says because we know diabetics can produce false high positives, likewise we know that older non-diabetics also have the similar vascular disease as diabetics. Do you agree that ABIs in general are worthless? in the general geriatric population. I'm, I'm not going to make that full commitment. I, if, if I'm worried about arterial disease, it's a nice down and dirty, easy start. Mm -hmm. You know, if I get a good signal and again, you don't just look at the ABI. I also listen to what the Doppler's telling me. If I have a triphasic signal and a right. good one, uh -huh. Hey, I got good vessels in this patient. I'm going to more likely to trust the ABI. Right. If I've got a monophasic, kind of signal no they're calcified and that's not it okay. and you know not to answer the diabetic diabetics i don't worry about macro i'm all about the micro circulation and that's your tcoms your laser dopplers um abis in diabetics i, I don't bother with it's it's sure. if i do it's to have the information but they all have crappy circulation but it's micro <laughs> it's micro more micro than macro got it right excellent all right excellent thanks for that that i think that handles that question great quite question well. Um, so let's, um, move on here. So let's kind of talk about compression. Then the, the use of compression with different underlying conditions. And uh, let's talk with the, the first big one that, you know, we're, we're, we already went with, with the ABI guidelines is arterial disease. And let's start with arterial disease in large vessel versus small vessel type of issues. So can you put up that, that cross section picture? Yep, I will pull that up. So let's start our journey with the basics. I mentioned anatomy and physiology. So what we're looking at is a cross section of the leg at the level of the calf. Now, the, the analogy I use is when people are going to ship something fragile to a friend, you don't just stick it in the box. You stick it in the box, you surround it with bubble wrap and packing peanuts and lots of things to do what I call take the crush so that your fragile item doesn't get crushed. So when you are looking at this cross section of the leg, if you look at the bottom right of the picture, you are seeing in red the major artery and you are seeing in the middle near the bone, the secondary artery, anterior tibia, or a posterior tib, and of course the dorsalis pedis. At that level, they're not. They're, that's just below the trifurcation. And you look, look at all of that soft tissue around those. You've got all that skin, all that fat and all that muscle to take the crush. And I want that picture to, your, to remain in your mind as we're talking about this topic, because that picture itself really, really answers the question of what's going on. Um, 
Let's take a look at that second picture, which is the Poiseli's rule. All right, for those of you that hated physics, this is Poiseli's rule. I only want you to look at two things, so ignore it. On the left, the delta P, forget the delta, just look at P. That's the pressure. And I want you to look at the bottom of the equation. The R is the radius of a circle. Or if you're kind of looking at it, it looks like our cross-section of the calf. Forget the exponent four. You don't even need that. What this says is, is that as the radius decreases, pressure goes up. So quick math. If you replace the numerator with the number 50, 8NLQ with 50, forget the pi, make the radius 1. 50 over 1 is 50. That's the pressure. If you make the radius smaller, make it, or let's make the radius 10 rather. If you make the radius 10, 50 over 10 is 5. That's your pressure. If you reduce the radius to 1, 50 over 1 is now 50. So by reducing the radius, you have increased the pressure. The reason for that is when you're applying compression around the smallest part of the leg, the ankle, that's why pressures at the ankle are higher than at the calf because the calf is larger, the radius is greater, and the pressure change between the calf and the ankle is quite varied. That's why the pressure in compression socks is two numbers, 40, 30. 40 at the ankle, 30 at the calf because like toothpaste in a tube, you want more pressure at the distal end and less pressure high so the pressure gradient is, low to, is high to low, pushes the venous out, Sidebar tip, we use an ankle circumference of 19 centimeters as our absolute go, no go for compression. If the ankle is 19 centimeters or less, we will not compress based on Poiseli's rule. At that point, we would add ABDs or three, four, five layers of the cotton or whatever you and pad that out. But just as a tip, 19 but Poiseli's rule is the law of physics that explains why the potential for pressure to cause problems exists. But let's talk about the anatomy of why it doesn't. Let's bring up that calcified picture. So here's a patient with calcified arteries. Um, and again, Bill, you mentioned and I reiterated 50 millimeters of mercury is the pressure that four layer compression, two layer compression, Velcro inelastics, that's the pressure that you need. Remember, we start at 90, engage gastrocnemia soleus. That gets you to a pressure of 50 in the feeble. That's the patients we're seeing. I don't mention 30. But look at that calcium. Um, you can go back to you, Bill. I mean, Bill, you're a strong guy. You bodybuild. I just started to go back in the gym to be a power lifter. With all your strength, Bill, are you strong enough to crush calcium? Um, not aware of it. No. Okay. And I, and I have felt calcium, you know, calcified <laughs> things before. And that it's not something I just put between my fingers and crush it into dust. Right. And that's the point is when we're talking about this, this severe arterial vascular disease. And again, I teach fourth year medical students. They're a ton of fun. Uh, you can get rid of the slide and go back to your face. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, the issue is you can't crush calcium. It's not possible. And, and in fact, when I'm doing an ABI, in answer to that first gentleman's question, when I'm doing the blood pressure cuff, I take the blood pressure cuff up to 200 millimeters of mercury. Once I hit 200, if I still have an arterial signal, I stop. Because if I can't shut off the vessels at 200, then I'm not going to shut them off at 220, 240, 260, 280, 300. It's not going to happen. So I don't torture the patient. They become non-compressible. But non-compressible is non-compressible. Right. How can 50 millimeters of mercury crush calcium? And more, if you remember that draw, that, that picture of the vein, do you mean to tell me that someone is able to generate enough circumferential compression to crush all that skin, all that fat, all that muscle down and crush two tiny little arteries? And even if you could do that, you wrapped a steel girder around them, how long would it take for the patient to scream in agony? Right. Seconds, not even that. I mean, patients get complained about too tight when it's 30 to 50 millimeters of mercury. Right. You can't possibly, it's not possible to crush calcium. It's not possible to crush all that soft tissue around.
Right. At the ankle, again, you, the, the pain. Now, caveats, obviously, you're not putting this on people that are SCI, spinal cord injury, because the key to this is they have to be able to engage gastrocnemius soleus. Right. So you're not going to put this on a para or a quadi because you are then creating pressure constant without anything. And remember, capillary closure pressure 32, these wraps go on at 50. You just shut off the capillaries and created a pressure-based tissue injury. So it's when, not without danger, but in terms of this concept of shutting off the arteries, it's anatomically, it's not possible. Physiologically, it's not possible. And I thought, I didn't you tell me you had read a study about that? Yeah, seen there was, um, I was actually, I watched a webinar, two studies that really, when I was doing my own due diligence, when you got me thinking, um, uh, <laughs> one was I actually looked up and found a study on limb occlusion pressures. And this study found that in order to occlude arterial flow off in a limb, arm or leg, it, was, it would take 250 to 450 millimeters of yep. mercury. And right. so common sense and logic simply brought me to the conclusion that, okay, if I need 250, let's go with the low end to cut off the blood flow. What is 50 going to do to that? Correct. And I'm just, I had to be honest. I'm like, I didn't need a study. I'm like, that's just basic math. Right. Uh, no, 50 is not going to occlude anything if you need 250. You know, that's right. only 20% of the actual yeah. pressure. You know, yeah. the other so, one, um, it was in a webinar that I watched that was done over in the UK on venous disease. And they put a screenshot up of it. I got to find the actual study in print. I've been trying to find it, but it's, it was done in the UK. But they cited, they showed a screenshot of the study, and they actually showed a study where they applied 50 millimeter of mercury compression on patients with an AVI of 0.4. And there was no further occlusion of their arterial flow. No. no. You know? So it's again, not, there not. was another thing that just kind of glaringly went against everything people out there have been taught. Yep. And that's real evidence. That's an actual study. Whereas, the, as we mentioned earlier, those guidelines don't have any studies to back them up. No, so I'm like, no. you got studies that show you different. You can't find a study to back your ABI guideline, but then you're going to put all your money on the guidelines? Right. No. That doesn't make no. any sense. Like you mentioned, is no. that really evidence-based practice when you no. when you choose that approach? I don't know, yeah. You know, the other thing is when we teach that capillary closure pressure in healthy people is 32 so if you take your thumbnail and gently, gently, gently push on it, assuming no nail polish, of course, the, the pressure it takes to blanch your thumbnail is 32 or any nail. So when I'm teaching people about pressures, I say, look, so what's 50? 50 is one and a half nail pushes. The pressure to push your nail bed is 32. Press half again as much. That's 50. It, it, it's essentially no pressure. It's really not much. The other concept that, that I want to get to real quickly, having looked at that anatomy, is that there's this horrible concept of venous, uh, of veins. If you have a house with pipes that are leaking, I would dare say that you'd not be able to get the water back into the pipes. Right. And veins work the same way. Veins leak in one direction, inside to out. Harkening back to that horrible physics, biology stuff, osmosis, diffusion, <laughs> in, you know, colloid osmotic pressures. I know someone out there is sweating. Um, <laughs> veins leak. Veins don't absorb. But there's essentially nothing going back in the veins. And arguably, arteries leak too. They're not solid. They're porous. We know lymphatics leak. Everything leaks. But you're not able to get fluid back in. So we will discuss later. And someone will say, oh, my God, I thought that you were pushing fluid back into the veins just doesn't happen. No. It's never been recorded. It's essentially not possible. Not with any appreciable volume. No. Sure. So excellent. Good. So we handled the the large vessel versus small vessel and the active versus immobile. And just to re-clarify and for our audience is you stay away from high therapeutic compression, which is 30 up and above, when you've got somebody who's got no active muscle pump going on in their in Correct. their lower limbs. If they're just flaccid or and or paralyzed, um, if you go and put that on there, as you said, capillary closing pressure at the skin surface is 32. So right. if, you put, if you put more than 32 in, you're going to occlude the capillaries. You know, because right. I always get that question from some students when I, when, I, when I get into this debate about 
compressing because they'll be like, well, what about small vessels? And this is the no, point. Not. As Great. long as the calf is moving and pumping, the pressure inside the tissue is constantly fluctuating. It's not right. steady. But when, like I said, and I think if I understand what you're saying, is when the there is no movement of the calf, it's static pressure. Right. And 90 that if they're in that's it's 90. So yeah. All yeah. right. Excellent. Excellent. So let's move on to the next one, which is another area that people, which is congestive heart failure and my compression. favorite. My favorite. <laughs> the thing that people forget is veins leak. And where does all that stuff go? Well, you know, we teach that. And again, I'm an osteopath. So we're trained that the lymphatics are where everything happens. And that's absolutely true. They are the scavenger. When you eat, the food is broken down. It's absorbed through the walls of the intestine into the lacteals. And then it goes into the lymphatics. And the lymphatics job is to take protein, carbohydrate, fat, and bring it to the liver. That's it. So everything that leaks, everything in the third space, everything in the soft tissues, infection, and we'll get to cellulitis coming up, of course, all that goes into lymphatics. The problem is that the veins are leaking, leaking, leaking. The lymphatics are very actively passive. They just suck stuff up 24 hours a day. But if you've got massive venous leakage, it overpowers the lymphatics. The lymphatics can no longer do their job. That's where the swelling occurs. And that's where you get that secondary lymphedema because you basically have smothered the lymphatics. Right. But the lymphatics, the lower, bring things back to the heart up this side on the left side, uh, the, the upper left chest and lower part of the body and the upper right chest, anything in there goes into the right vena cava. But the lymphatics are what brings back everything that leaks out. The veins, of course, bring back everything that stays in the veins. Sure. So when you've got venous disease that leaks, it's out of the venous system and the lymphatics are picking it up. Right. So thinking that putting compression, all that's doing is stopping the veins from leaking. If you're leaking at 50 and I put compression at 50, I've stopped your leak. Right. That means the lymphatics can pick it up and suck it up and put it in or not being smothered. Now, the caveat is in someone with renal failure, that's where I'll back off. I'll go with what is poorly termed light compression because I want some venous leakage a little bit. I don't want it all in the veins. And I let my nephrologist dialyze off that fluid that is staying in the venous system. Mm -hmm. And then, so for a week, I'll go with, you know, 30 millimeters. And then at the end of that week, after they've dialyzed, I bang it up to 50. And then I lock 50 on that leg. That leg's now being treated and I'm good. Then we go to the other leg if it's involved, that a lower compression, let them dialyze off the fluid they can't normally urinary excrete, and then. So that's my pandering in the case of renal failure. Okay. If they can pee like everybody else, guess what? I go full bore compression, and it's it's done. They, urine, they, they excrete it in the urine. It doesn't make it because the lymphatics are where all that leakage is picked up. Right. Doesn't happen. The, you're not pushing it back into the veins. And that's the major concern I hear. They say, well, wait a minute, you're pushing it into the veins. That means you're creating afterload. That means you're stressing the heart, which can't pump, and you're going to throw them into CHF. And it's like, no, that's illogical. That's not how the physiology works. It doesn't work that way at all. Absolutely. You're not increasing afterload. You're, you're not. Exactly. The afterload is self-offloading, and you're just preventing that from happening, but it's not increasing it. All right. Excellent. Good, good point. Excellent. So uh, the next one... Um, is DVTs. Ah, my favorite. This is the <laughs> one where when my students and people come to visit and I ask them that and, and they know, they know looking at my face that I'm going to give them an answer they're not happy with, but the knee jerk is, oh my God, I'm going to say no. So um, what do you want to do? You want to put up the Vircal slide first? Let's put up the DVT slide. Let's okay. have some fun. So that's a DVT. There it is. Look at that nasty thing. All, you know, it, the valves are working in the middle picture and son of a gun on the right, something happened and you now got a massive DVT in the leg and the blood stops. And of course the edema and all the other stuff and you worry about progression. And of course, to speak for our audience, you're all worried that, oh my gosh, what if, what if what you do pushes the clot away, breaks the clot loose, breaks loose an emboli and you put compression on, Am I going to go to jail until my beard is down to my knees? And so with that, let's bring up the next slide, Bill. Let's talk evidence and science. 
All right, so for those of you that remember, this is Virchow's triad, V-I-R-C-H-O-W-S. Did not have the pleasure of meeting this gentleman, but he was brilliant. These are the three components of DVT or any kind of thrombosis. The top is, and I hate the word stasis, by the way, because nothing is ever static. It's just reduced flow, but for the sake of this, we'll leave it. So the three components that create a clot are bottom left, an intimal injury happens it creates the inflammatory cascade, the injury cascade. You get increased coagulation. You get deposition of, of, of things, and the platelets start to coalesce. The platelets then grab the fibrin and all that other stuff, and, of course, you wind it with a clot. It's exacerbated by the fact that the blood is hypercoagulable. I hate the word thick. And, of course, what do we treat it with? Blood thinners. So we're stuck with that term. And of course, then the problem is that the blood flow is poor. So the combination of poor blood flow, also called stasis, uh, blood that is extra thick, also called hypercoagulable, and the inciting injury to the vessel wall creates thrombosis. The reason this is up is this is why clots form. And the question the audience is, of these three components, which of them can you definitively impact on? Well, you can't do anything for the vessel wall injury. That's out. That's internal. Hypercoagulability, of course, there's plenty of rat poison out there, cumin and other things to reduce the hypercoagulability. But the real problem is, is that the veins are not moving, the venous blood, excuse me. And so what can you do? Well, remember, no matter what you are doing to the venous system, you can only normalize it. There is no way to turbocharge. You can't stick a catheter in the veins of a foot and then blast blood in there under high pressure. It doesn't work. And the other thing to remember is, what do we normally tell these people to do? We tell them to elevate their legs. So when they elevate their leg, you have that pressure head. The arterials go to the capillaries. The capillaries then turn into venules and veins. You've got that pressure of gravity squeezing blood by the thrombosis and arguably that may be greater than normal but when you put four layer two layer of velcro in elastic you are only normalizing it because remember the other important part how do these clots break down they break down through thrombolysis and how does thrombolysis occur blood flow past the clot breaks it down so by putting someone into four layer compression and normalizing, not maximizing their venous return, you are reducing stasis, you are taking one of the components of Virchow's triad out, and you are bringing thrombolytic factors to break down that clot. Because your other option is lifting your leg. And lifting your leg happens in half a second, and you create a pressure head, and that would blow the clot loose. So in terms of pure science, pure evidence, pure anatomy, pure laws of physics, four-layer, two-layer compression should not and will not break clots loose. It will, in fact, promote thrombolysis. Excellent. And that's a, that's a great explanation. I you know, I'm, this is the first time we've really understood it. I don't deal with, I haven't dealt with a lot of DVTs in my career. So it's good to understand that for my students going forward as I continue. Yeah, no evidence. There. So, and again, no evidence to the contrary. No one's ever done a study that says, oh, no, you put it on, it busts the clots, loots. It, it's never been done. It's that same paranoia as the ABI. There's no science. It's just, uh, and, and it's a knee jerk. It's all often funny, Bill. I love to ask the question just to watch their faces because they just <laughs> get this horrible look of pain. Like, oh, God, I know he's going to say yes about compression, but I just can't bring myself to agree. <laughs> We just got a question that popped up on this subject, and it says, does the same process work for people with chronic DVTs? Um, yes, arguably it should. D Virchow's triad talks about DVT. You'll notice there is no word chronic or acute there. Chronic recurrent DVT is caused by something. Um, again, in patients like that, they've got recurrent injury to the venous intima. But again, if you maximize venous return and maximize venous flow, then according to the laws of physics and the scientific evidence and the physiology, you should reduce the risk of DVT. No question about it. Excellent. Excellent. Plus the pain, plus the swelling. Right. Yeah, exactly. So for our last topic, is, of course, is the infamous compression with cellulitis. Oh, my God. 
Just had another case of that. They called me and the nurse said, couldn't get hold of you, center to, center to the ER with cellulitis. And I said, what was the problem? Well, the leg was red and hot and swollen. And I said, who did it bother more, you or the patient? And she said, you know, honestly, I think it bothered me more. And I said, why didn't you go to the ER? <laughs> If it bothered you more, you go to the ER. The patient didn't need to go. You go to the ER. You know, same with antibiotics. They put her antibiotics. Who'd it bother more? Why didn't you take the antibiotics? Right. I mean, the, this this is the age-old conundrum of inflammation versus infection. And we've gone over a million times that we don't have the time to go into odor and drainage, which I still get occasionally and keep saying to people, it has nothing when you have a inflammatory condition, edema, and a hole, the organic fluid leaks out, it rots and smells, and we don't treat death with antibiotics, but you know, <laughs> sometimes you win. But the cellulitis is the same thing. It's, if indeed it was a venous uh, a, a inflammation, you know, a venous dermatitis, right. that's just the yucky venous blood irritating the tissues causing inflammation. Right. And my argument with that is red, hot, swollen, tender, I just described a sunburn. Nobody takes antibiotics for a sunburn. Red hot, swollen, tender. I just described a sprained ankle. Nobody takes antibiotics for a sprained ankle. So if they've got known venous disease, um, why? Well, it's because we don't make the diagnosis. Instead of telling them short term, get your leg up, which we've talked about, mm -hmm. or getting them in two, four layer, or the venous uh, inelastic compressions or something else, mm -hmm. it's easier to... Because what happens, they go to the hospital, they get put on antibiotics, and you know what they do? They put them in bed and elevate their leg. <laughs> Good point. Right. And then the leg gets better. And, of course, then what we hear is, well, they had to put me on a really strong antibiotic. And the funny part about that as a sidebar, Bill, is you understand that if there's, if there's such a thing as strong antibiotics, <laughs> then there has to be something called weak antibiotics, right? <laughs> I mean, can you imagine a patient going in and saying, you know, I'm not so sure it's bad. Can I have a weak antibiotic this time instead of the strong ones? Oh, yeah. Doc, I'm sorry. Are you, your comic relief in this, on our interviews, crack, Thank I got you. smiley faces and laughing emojis all over the comments. Section. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, just, it's just pandering to paranoia and foolishness. But the thing to remember about, now let's say it's a real rip roar in cellulitis, a rusty dog chain and nail, and you got a pus fling in leg. And of course, the, that's where, you know, in reality, it's like, well, I'm worried about compressing. Mm -hmm. We just go back to our earlier discussion. Where does all that stuff in the third space, the skin, the soft tissues, the muscle go? Into the lymphatics. Right. But if you've got that kind of inflammation, now you've got ve the venous leakage goes way, way up. The capillary leakage goes way, way up. So once again, your poor, hapless lymphatics that are just trying to mind their own business and suck stuff up get smothered by all that venous leakage, right. you lose lymphatic function. And remember, lymphatics also look down and the protein, carbohydrate, and fat, that's also called white blood cells and that's also called bacteria. Because right. remember, your lymph nodes are monitoring stations. They're looking down and saying, I see protein, carbohydrate, and fat. That was yesterday's bologna sandwich. Uh-oh, <laughs> protein, carbohydrate, fat. That's an infection from that rusty chain alert the immune system. Let's get some white cells, some monocytes and stuff down here. Let's get the lymph nodes enlarged so they can be more active. Mm -hmm. So with a true soft tissue infection, oh my gosh, you bet your butt you want compression because if I can stop the veins from leaking, now I've got my lymphatics maximized and doing what they're doing. Right. It's Thanks. all about the venous leakage. That's mm -hmm. it. Stop them from leaking and messing stuff up. Let your lymphatics do what they're supposed to do. Right. And I think a lot of this times, you know, Doc, the way you put it, and obviously I appreciate your your science and your evidence behind what you present. But a lot of times when you start really thinking about it, a lot of this stuff boils down to common sense and logic. And sometimes I just wonder amongst my fellow wound care clinicians out there, and I know that there's a lot of people on here that are watching that probably have the same frustration. It's just like common sense just completely left the planet. Um, right. And it really just, you know, it frustrates a lot of clinicians. So, uh, you know, it's interviews like this where we're hoping that we can educate the masses. And, you know, again, these are recorded. 
people can go back. So again, to my audience out there, anybody who watches this, please share. I mean, you can go to our Facebook page and, or our, our Wound Care Gurus and copy and paste the link and email it, text it to your favorite person that really needs to hear it and have right. them watch this. Um, I got the a other question thing- that just came up here. Um, let me just make sure I didn't miss an earlier one because there's been a bunch of popping up. Let me go real, while you're looking at real quick. One of the things that we talk about, and I gave this lecture at Wild on Wounds, and, and I called it Herding Cats, and we'll be working with Bill to present this in a different format. And it's basically how do you talk to doctors, physicians, know-it-all providers that really don't know anything? And the answer to that question in simplest terms is ask them to give you an educational program and tell them, you want to have them find you three or four nice articles on, the, on in this case, the venous system. You know, you talk a lot about cutting off the circulation, Doc. We would love to see a couple articles that you've got where they talk about how the circulation is cut off with venous disease and, and, and give us that evidence because these guys will involute because there isn't any. Right. And, and it's one way to get them to really say, you know, it's funny, Doc, because everything we've heard, especially from that turkey with Bill, on uh, wound gurus <laughs> says that it can't happen. And it's interesting, you can't find the literature. Um, gosh, maybe, maybe he's right, maybe it can happen. You know, why do we think it is? What do you think about this? Um, you know, creating controversy, creating right. angst, um, creating doubt and creating education ultimately is kind of where this goes. You know, if you can't defend your point, then you're kind of forced to look at the other guys. Right, I got a question that came up. Um, um, once it does, does Doc have any papers on this topic? Uh, no. Uh, again, there's no double blind randomized. You just saw a presentation using anatomy, physiology, which are irrefutable, and the irrefutable laws of physics. That's mm-hmm. it. Now, yeah, the, asking for literature and not to be rude to the questioner is ridiculous. It makes no sense. We haven't done any studies. That's the problem. There are no studies. So the question is, are you evidence-based or not? Because if the evidence doesn't exist to the contrary, then that means that the positive is good. Right. Makes sense. We don't make laws to tell people what they can do. We make laws to tell people what they can't do. Right. Exactly. Another question. How effective do you feel pneumatic compression really is? What a fabulous. If you look at what we talked about, engagement of gastrocnemia soleus, pumps the blood through the valves against the fascia. The pressure in the vein is then dropped from 90 to 50 in the feeble, 90 to 30 for young people like Bill. Um, Unfortunately, the pneumatic compression does nothing. It doesn't do any of that stuff. It's because it's squeeze, 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 squeeze. In a paraplegic or quadriplegic, we use those to kind of facilitate. But if you look at the anatomy and the function, they, they really don't do what they need to do in that. Are they better than nothing? Arguably. But for example, in lymphedema, the problem is you usually have a proximal obstruction up high. Mm -hmm. And when you're talking about a pump that's pumping from distal to proximal, I call that the 10 car pileup under the bridge. If there's a 10 car pileup under the bridge and you try and push car 10 forward, all you're going to do is smash them all together you have to take car number one and move it under the bridge, go back and get car number two, move it under the bridge, get car number three, move it under the bridge, car number four. And then you can start getting car 10 and move the whole pile forward. But if you don't offload proximal, and actually one of the wow lectures, God, I forget her name, I'm ashamed, the physical therapist who's a lymphedema therapist, Uh taught me that, taught me that. And, And I've said, that makes so much sense that's why most of the pumps are better than nothing and not to kill, but not much because they don't duplicate. They don't reduplicate the physiology. So the answer to your question is if they can't engage gastrocnemia soleus, move their pump, their ankle, they're better than nothing. If they can, you don't need them. Lymphedema, different story because lymphedema is a different fluid, thicker pressure gradients. But for pure venous disease, I would tell you not really. All right. Next question. What treatment would do you recommend for a patient that has a scabbed over ulcers on every toe, mild to moderate impairment based on ABI? Would it be okay to compress them? Um, yes, I would. But the question in my mind is, and, and I, I didn't get this point in, 
why do they have scabs on their toes? One of the things I teach, there are 11 and only 11 wound care diagnoses. If, if you're not listening to this, don't tell anybody. 11. So the question I'd pose to you is, why do they have ulcers on their toes? And if they're sporadic ulcers, I would tell you two reasons. One, they showered emboli or two, trauma. They're rubbing their toes against something. Mm -hmm. And if that's the cause, then you need to get them in something protective. Right. Will it help to treat their venous disease if they have definitive venous insufficiency? You bet. Sure. One of the things I've learned after 30 years is if someone has any kind of issue involving the lower extremity, ankle area and above, they go into four layer compression. Why? Because I believe that every lower extremity injury causes venous compromise. Big, small, it doesn't matter. And if I can maximize venous return, then I have approved healing. And look at that. There's a lot of new studies coming out for magical dressings mm -hmm. with lower extremity wounds. And they're saying, well, I put the dressing on to take three months to heal. Isn't it wonderful? And my argument is if it occurred between the ankle and the knees, that patient should have had venous compression. You can't hurt them and you can only help them by maximizing venous disease. All right, cool. One more question that's uh, coming up here, unless somebody puts one up in the next minute or two. Uh, any compression recommendation for lymphedema? Um, you know what? I am an expert diagnostician at lymphedema. However, you don't want me to wrap your leg. That's why I have my CLT codas and PTs. Mm -hmm. um, you know, remember there are different stages of lymphedema. Stage zero, stage one is water-based. It's the soft pitting. And so with that, we put them in two-layer compression, four-layer compression, the Velcro inelastics. We love those. But once they start getting into what I call definitive lymphedema, and remember, lymphedema in the advanced stages, they look like the Michelin man. They look like the Stay Puff Marshmallow man. They've got lobulations and sharp cutoffs. And, of course, stemmer sign where you grab the base of the second toe and squeeze it. And if you cannot squeeze the base of the second toe, that's a positive stemmer sign, pathognomonic for lymphedema. So to answer the question, early stage water-based where they pit, four-layer compression, two-layer compression, Velcro inelastics, lovely, 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 will work every time. Once they start getting into the stage two lymphedemas, the stage threes with the lobby, you're going to have to pad those crevices. You need the chip bags. You need the different uh, widths to exert different pressures uh, via Pacelli's rule, by the way, <laughs> and the law of Laplace. So yeah, the lymphedema should be done by people trained and certified in lymphedema, um, either or. I like the CLTs. There aren't enough of them, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, I know that, that, that the course is offered. Um, the diagnosis to me, because I would tell you, lymphedema is probably the most poorly diagnosed. Not every flavored gelatin is jello. Not every <laughs> copier is a Xerox. And not all leg swelling is lymphedema. Amen. So I, and my, my wife, Denise, my partner and, and uh, co, uh, cohort in crime uh, is a CLT, you know, so yes. she's got, she wouldn't answer that, in a, you know, her way with compression and stuff. I, I myself have minimal, I have a functional understanding of lymphedema. If I get a lymphedema patient, I just refer them to somebody who knows more than I do. I'm not going to try to be an expert on everything. So another question came up. Oh, this is, this is a good one. Uh, do you feel ACE wraps are as effective as two or four layers? Absolutely not. The Cochrane report came out single layer elastic. Because remember, there's two phases to the venous system. There's, there's um, active and passive. When you are standing, and again, if you're standing, and remember with the four, let's talk about four layer and two layer in the Velcro elastics. When you are standing, you've got to keep the pressure down to 50 that you've achieved. So you need something that is squeezing. That's, an, that's called a resting pressure. So you want a resting pressure is 50. When you are calf pumping, that's a working pressure. The problem is if you put an ace wrap on and pump your calf, what happens to the ace wrap? It stretches. Yeah. And so the pressure of the ace wrap drops. So ace wraps are good for resting pressure. They have no working pressure. When you work, they stretch. In contrast, things like the Una's boot, when you put the Una's boot on, let's say you put it on at compression and they pump, they pump, they pump. Now you're creating a working pressure because the Una boot doesn't move. So the pressure with an Una boot when you pump 
drops to that 50 millimeter mercury, you know, or lower right. thing. But the problem is when the leg shrinks or when you're, at, at, you know, then is the Unaboot applying any compression? No. no. And the leg swells up. Unaboots lose their compression after eight hours. We've right. seen that. Mm -hmm. So the answer to the ACE wrap question is no. Your treatment has to be for both passive or resting pressure of 50 and working pressure. The four layers take care of that by virtue of their layers. The two layers, we did the research on that. They do. Ace wraps only provide resting pressure. You're missing 50% of the treatment. The other thing is that no one can apply an ace wrap the same pressure. Remember that law of Puselli. Right. Are you sure that you can apply the exact same compression on each layer as it goes up? No. And you wind up with legs that look like the banister on a stairs. Right. And I'll, yeah. to add to that, Doc, um, I have a great article and I can, you know, anybody wants it, you can just email me at Bill at Wound Care Gurus um, or, or message us through our Facebook page. But there's an article that was written, it was published in podiatrytoday.com and I have a link to it and they talk about all the different forms of compression and they actually make the case in there why ACE wraps are an ineffective because they're actually too elastic. You want right. to have some elasticity, but if it's too, you basically defeat the purpose of it because it's just too stretchy then. Um, right. And it becomes less and less effective. You know, even even if you look at um, some of the things like the, you know, the, the, the single layer wraps that are approved for compression, like SurePress and Cedo Press. Right, right. They don't stretch like an ACE wrap does. Right. You know, and so right. there's a, still a limited range in there. And, you know, I, from what I've understood and some of the stuff I've read on, you know, when you get into short stretch bandages, you know, those are bandages that are anywhere from inelastic up to a 60% of stretch. Long right. stretch are 140 to 300%. Well, if you get to 300% like an ACE wrap, it's pretty much there, useless because yeah. it's too, like I said, it's too elastic. You can overstretch. Yeah. Yep. The only other quick, quick point to make before we sign off or whatever is I want to remind people that the goal of this is success and your patient is ultimately the one responsible. So when I've got a, a newbie or a patient that I'm concerned about, when I'm telling my nurses or my team to put the four, uh, four layer, two layer, whatever, I always tell them to put it on loose and, and arguably not so much the Velcro elastics, but the, the stuff you throw away. And I tell them to put it on loose the first time. Now, granted, you could say, well, you're throwing one away, but my argument is that even if you put that four layer or two layer on loose and you measure ankle and calf, they're still going to shrink, but you haven't hurt the patient. You haven't put it on at compression, which is the 50, because then the patient's going to have success. Their leg is shrunk. You haven't hurt them. And then I say to the patient, wow, that's amazing. You shrank a centimeter and a half at the ankle and calf. You know, can we add... 10% more compression, 15 more compression. It won't hurt and it'll make things happen even faster. And they do that. So when in doubt, go low, sacrifice that wrap right. for the patient's well-being. It, it wound care psychology because you get them on the, tr the road. Then if the next one's a little bit more snug, they already know it's successful. And that's the important thing right. about all I, this. I've, I've, always kind of, I've always kind of taught that to my students when you have somebody that complains that it's too tight or it's too painful, you know, because they're not used to that tightness. It's not, as I always tell them, it's not cutting off their blood flow. Let's just make that clear. It's just an right. uncomfortable tightness. So I always tell them, I said, you know what? Start low and work your way high. It's called acclimation. Uh-oh. Hey, Doc, you froze up. We lost you. He said that might happen tonight, everybody. <laughs> but he said he would log right back out and come right back in. So um, I'm just going to let Doc re-log back in again. And uh, I'm going to, I got a question that came up for, well, here he comes. He's back. He is back. We lost you there, Doc, for a second. What happened to you? Nope. That nah, got cut off again. But anyways, uh, somebody asked about having my wife do a lesson on lymphedema. I'm more than um, certain that we can probably make that happen. And I think she would love to do that. Um, 
As soon as the doc re-signs back on here, everybody, there's one more question. Somebody about a favorite two-layer. Um, I mean, there's a number of different two-layer products out there. I'd be curious to see what, you know, Doc likes. I mean, there's the Coban system um, <clears throat> and a few others, but I'd be curious to see um, what Doc has to say. So while we're kind of waiting on that, I appreciate all of your um, uh, your feedback tonight, guys. You guys have been a great audience. And um, if you, um, oh, here he comes. He's calling back in, so. Hey, we lost you there, Doc. I thought you were yeah, coming yeah, that back was weird. for a second. Yeah, yeah, my laptop died. My apologies. So where were we? <laughs> it's called the power cord, Doc. You're supposed to uh, plug yeah. it in. <laughs> yeah, maybe, and my wife said, you know, we're having trouble with the Internet. I said, well, maybe we'll get lucky. So I'm back on my phone, but we're good. All right. So anyway, somebody asked what your favorite two-layer was. Um, you know, I, I like them all. We did the research on the original two-layer, the Coban 2. The other ones we've used work great. I the, the, the What makes my decision on which wrap to use is basically the shape of the leg. If they have a cone leg, no no good gastrocnemius in curve behind the knee, I go with a two-layer because I'm worried about slippage. Because if they've got a cone leg, as soon as that wrap starts to slip, you've lost it. Two layers stick to each other and support. But if they've got a good popliteal in curve where the calf goes into the back of the knee and the calf is wider, uh, four layer works just great because for the wrap to drop, it's got to stretch over the calf, which right. usually doesn't happen. Gotcha. And then there's one more question. Where would adjustable Velcro compression wrap systems fit in? Oh, my gosh. Um, the, well, the companies will tell you they're the same. Um, I don't like them during treatment. And the reason is because then you get into compliance issues. If I lock someone up in a four or a two, now again, nothing that a trusty pair of scissors won't take care of by the patient. But if I put them in a four or a two, they're going to wear the four or the two. And we change those twice a week. But if I put them in a Velcro inelastic, uh, you know, the, the, the Faro wrap or the circuit, and there's other companies, I don't want to sound, in, you know, not leaving anyone out. There's some right. great new products as well. There's another one that's bungee based that we think is quite highly of. But the point is the patient then goes pop, 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 and the wraps off. So I'd rather get something that ensures a little more compliance. And I think that the four and the two layers do that. Is it substantially better? Ah, hard to say. Sure. Understand. Excellent. Well, hey, Doc, I just want to thank you again for an excellent show. Uh, you always bring... So much great evidence, but the humor factor, everybody enjoys that as well, too. So uh, I'm going to let you go. Thank you. Oh, I was going to put up your contact information here real quick in case anybody wants to reach Doc Miller. You can reach him at doc at millercaregroup.com is his um, email address. So if anybody has any questions for Doc, again, feel to reach out to him directly. Um, I know he would certainly be more than happy to take any request for information or any questions i assume correct doc that's it happy to help our colleagues out excellent well i'm gonna basically let you go for now then doc i really appreciate it again i know the audience does and i'm sure we'll have you back again with some other fun controversial topic out there to shake up the room <laughs> i was world. gonna say make the word controversial bill otherwise i'm just like everybody else another sheep <laughs> all right we'll talk to you later doc thanks again Thank you, buddy. Thanks, audience. Appreciate chance. All right, everybody. That is it for tonight. Uh, we had a great session. Uh, I hope everybody enjoyed it. We had some great number of viewers tonight during the whole thing. And again, this is recorded. It'll be available on our YouTube <clears throat> channel as well as on our Facebook page. So with that, folks, I just want to say good evening and thanks again for your participation. I hope you found this educational, informative, as well as an enjoyable way to spend your Tuesday night. God bless you all, and we will see you again. Mm -hmm.